Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Curtis Miller. Curtis is also a research staff member um, at the Institute for Defense Analysis um, with, with Defense Analyses with myself. Um, uh, in his role as a, as a research staff, um, he advises analysts on effective use of statistical techniques, especially pertaining to modeling and simulation activities, which is um, an aspect of his talk um, today. Uh, he specializes in U.S. Navy uh, t &E efforts, um, primarily for um, DOT and &E. um, Curtis uh, earned uh, his Ph.D. in mathematics from the University of uh, Utah in 2020. Um, has authored several publications on statistical methods, computational data analysis, um, and R packages. Um, he'll be speaking today on functional data analysis and how we apply it for validation. Um, so let's please welcome our speaker. Well, thank you, John, for the introduction, and uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, it is a pleasure to see you all at this uh, presentation. And as John mentioned, I'm going to be speaking to you today about how we could use a set of statistical methods known as functional data analysis for uh, our modeling simulation uh, validation efforts. So going very briefly over what I'm going to be talking about today, uh, we're going to be focusing largely on MNS concerning radar tracks, where maybe the object, maybe we are studying an object flying through space where we're tracking that object with the radar track, or maybe we're talking about a radar system itself and a modeling in an MNS uh, system that is trying to model the radar system itself. So when we're doing modeling and simulation, that validation may involve comparing live data to simulation outputs in order to determine whether the MNS is giving us believable outputs that are informing us about what would actually happen in the real world. So I would contend that data sets such as radar tracks, those probably need to be assessed as a whole, looking not just at a few numbers coming from a track, but looking at the entire track. Right, and trying to come up with a way to handle that track as a continuum. The functional data methods that I will be discussing, they can use whole tracks, and this can allow for using those entire tracks in our modeling and simulation assessments. So uh, after that preview, let's uh, talk a little bit about where, what we're talking about today. So weapon system modeling and simulation, this is rather, there's a lot of uh, effort that's put into developing models and simulation tools to help us understand the performance of our weapon systems. And I, I will go to MNS workshops and they will talk about how MNS can, you can do statistics with MNS data because you get lots of data, which is nice if we are able to believe what's actually coming out of MNS. Like at the end of the day, we're not here to do statistics, we're here to le learn about actual weapon systems, right? And additionally, like, Statistics isn't something that you do at large sample sizes. It's something that you do at any sample size, right? You need to have statistic, statistical methods that you can do at any sample size. And I'm trying to talk today about statistical methods that can work even in situations where we may not necessarily have a large number of real world runs, but we still have a lot of information about it. So um, in order for us to be able to use an MNS tool, we need to know that the MNS tool is trustworthy, whether it be a digital simulation that's living entirely inside of a computer or we're talking about something like a hardware in the loop type simulation. So the question today is how we're going to be able to make statistical comparisons of, real, of MNS outputs to real world live data. And the type of data sets that I'm talking about today are going to be data sets where um, there may not necessarily be a lot of trials, but any single trial may potentially be information rich. So examples of this could be flight paths where we have an object flying through the atmosphere or flying through space or flying underneath the ocean where we get a lot of information about the position of that object as it travels um, according to time. Radar tracks are a similar thing where we have the track of a position of an object as, it tra as that object is moving. We may not have that many tracks or maybe we do have a lot of tracks, but uh, with any individual track we're going to have a lot of information. Uh, there's other types of data sets as well. Like, for example, if we're talking about live flyer, there's blast fragment distributions, where you do an arena test and you blow it up an object in an arena and the blast fragments distribute out and hit the sides of the arena. The distribution of those blast fragments, or even the distribution of some of the characteristics of those fragments, like, for example, their size, could be uh, considered a functional type of data, uh, a type of data set where you have a lot of information even for one individual trial, where you end up with an entire distribution. 
Um, the last thing in my illustration is the sound velocity profile, which nature makes sound velocity profiles, not humans. But at the same time, this is something that we would care a great deal about. So for those of you who are not aware, a sound velocity profile is, um, we we're talking about undersea systems. The speed at which sound travels depends on the depth at which that sound is, is coming from. And the sound velocity profile tells the speed of sound as it varies through depth, which can result in sound propagating through the water in rather interesting ways. So this could be very important to the behavior of undersea systems, including sonars, including torpedoes, including boats, as in the submarines. All of this is going to be something that's very important to how they're going to actually behave. So this isn't something so much that we would try. I mean, we may try and predict it with modeling and simulation. But it's certainly something that we will probably want to include maybe on the right-hand side of our regression equations as something that's important to characterizing the performance of a weapon system. So it's potentially an important predictor. And it could be possible to take an entire sound velocity profile as a function and plug it in and say, well, how does the performance depend on that curve? I'm going to call all of these data sets today functional, not in the sense that the data functions, and not in the sense that it is a functional data set, but in the sense that the data sets I'm talking about are understood to be mathematical functions, right, where you stick in inputs and you get outputs out. So I do have a running example today, which is going to be modeling the radar track of a bomber's flight. We have a bomber, it comes in, it does a turn, and then it flies out, and we have a radar that is tracking the position of the bomber, sending out radar pulses, getting returns back, and then saying, how far away is this object from me? By the way, just for what it's worth, all the data in this presentation is completely notional. Right, I made it all up. Um, so that's going to be our example for today. There's lots of different types of radar. There's radars that I think pretty much any radar can give you velocity information using Doppler shift, right, where it sends out a radar pulse and then gets um, the speed at which that object is traveling back. So I think pretty much any ra radar can do that, but other radars, like the one on your car, can only give you range, how far away an object is. And then there's the radars that actually fe feature in uh, weapon systems that are two-dimensional, three-dimensional motion radars that are tracking an object as it travels through space. Today, for my simple demonstration, I'm going to be focusing on a range-only radar, just to keep things simple. The setup I'd like for you to consider is one where we have... 20 live range-only radar tracks. So we've gone out to some facility, we've had our bomber do 20 flights, and then we get 20 tracks, we get 20 readings. Right? And then for each one of those trials, we then re replicate those live trials 100 times in modeling and simulation. So for each live trial, we have 100 replicates for what, the model, uh, for what our computer model says might happen. Right? So if this is going to be our setup, the statistical question is going to be if it, what we're going to try to determine statistically is whether the MNS is reflective of reality, which in this case, what that's going to mean is if our live tracks look typical according to what the MNS says, then that's a reason to believe that the MNS is giving us a reasonable description of what's happening in the real world. If our live tracks look unusual, according to MNS, then we would say that the live track's not coming from the same distribution, which would actually cast doubt on the MNS. But the MNS doesn't have a good characterization of what, what would happen in reality. So now let's get into our demonstration, again, with all with notional data. So here is, our, here is one example of one of our flights where we get uh, radar readings. And someone looking at this may realize this is a really bad radar. That is a lot of variability in our readings. And the reason why that is is because I want to make things statistically more interesting. So, <laughs> um, so, let's add, so I've jammed up the variability in our readings. So for any one of those points, that is a reading from the radar about how far away it thinks the object is. At that time, it made that reading. And from each of these readings, we're probably not going to work with the individual readings themselves, but instead what we're going to do is come up with a smooth curve that is going to pass through and interpolate the readings, describing where we think the position of the object is. We will call this smooth curve the radar track. So we're going to come up with these tracks for the live flight and each one of the MNS flights within a vignette. And you'll see a picture like this where we have, here's the live flight, here's the distribution of all the MNS flights. We're going to do this for every single vignette to, and then, and uh, 
look at this and try to understand how typical the live flights are relative to their respective uh, matching MS flights. And I have seen a lot of, I, I've seen a number of documents where basically validation ends up drawing this picture and then taking a Rorschach test of whether the live flights match the MS flights, which I will contend is a like it's not something that you shouldn't do, but it's something that it's not, it should not end there, right? There's a lot of ways that you could convince yourself of just about whatever you want to see when looking at these pictures, where you could say, well, only a few of these are not matching, if any are not matching. Uh, or maybe you could say, well, if I took any random M&S flight and then called it the live flight, it also would look kind of odd. So it, it's so the live flight isn't as any more unusual than any, so the live flight isn't any more unusual than an M&S flight. Or there's also just room for subjectivity. It's like two people are allowed to disagree and then they get to stare at each other. <laughs> so like, and, and there's just, how, do you, how are you gonna resolve those differences? And, and throughout all of this, there isn't really any notion of mathematical or statistical error control. All those things that come with our hypothesis testing that say at this level of type one error, we can achieve this level of type two error for this given sample size. All that stuff, we are not achieving that when we're just looking at pictures, which again, I, I've seen a lot of cases where this is basically what we're doing, right? We just look at these pictures and then say, do we like what we see? Now I can tell you, spoilers, that I designed this data set in such a way that the MNS is not matching up with reality, right? So if you are, were able to convince yourself that actually this is not matching, then you have deceived yourself. So given that I have dragged pictures through the mud, what should we do? Well, the first thing that we're going to do is compute the mean track, right? Which, how would we compute a mean track? For any point in time, just take the average of all of the live track times, or no, all of the other track times to get the mean track's position, right? So you're just taking an average of curves, effectively. Like, I think of this as I'm taking a bunch of functions, I'm adding them together, and then I divide by the number of functions. So this is corresponding to how one would usually compute the mean. So you will compute the mean curve or the mean track for any one of these vignettes within a vignette in a previous iteration of this slide deck, and maybe I will have time if people want to see it in the backup slides, I was talking about how we, we could do confidence intervals for functional data, but I have decided to cut that because I wanted to talk about other things. So, um, but basically there are ways to construct confidence intervals that are sensitive to the fact that we're working with functional data this time, whether we're doing a pointwise interval or simultaneous confidence interval. But we're going to compute all of these mean flight, tra uh, all of these mean tracks for each one of these vignettes. And once we compute the mean track, we're going to start comparing the tracks that we see within a vignette to, um, to the mean track to see how the live track matches up. Right, so what, are we what do I mean exactly by that? We're going to look at the distance between functions. This right here corresponds to what's known as a Euclidean distance between two curves, right, two functions. Which, Euclidean distance, going back to your geometry class, how do you find the distance between two points on a plane? Uh, take the difference between uh, your x coordinates, take that difference and square it, add it with the difference between the y coordinates squared, add those up, and then take the square root. Well, that's what we're doing right here, except now there's an integral, and you're looking at the difference between two functions at each point in time, taking those differences, square them, integrating, and then taking the square root. That's how you find the distance between two functions, at least in what we're doing today. So we're going to come up, we're going to look at the distance within a vignette of, of the live flight from each other flight in that vignette, or each other track. I'm sorry, I keep getting those two things switched up. Um, so. Once we do that, we come up with a distribution of distances within a vignette. Most of these are MS distances, but the red line in each one of these pictures is where the live flight, uh, where, is where the live track fell in terms of how far it, away it was from the mean. So we're going to see, we're going to be checking whether the live track tends to end up in the, the uh, right-hand tail of these distributions, because if it's on that tail, then that means that that live track tends to be further away from the mean than all the other MNS tracks, and thus it doesn't really seem to be coming from the same distribution. In fact, in each one of these uh, graphs, I have a number here that represents the number of MNS uh, 
tracks that are at least as far away from the mean track as that live track. Right? We can take each one of those numbers and then combine them together using a statistical procedure known as the Fisher Combined Probability Test to make an overall assessment of how unusual live flights tend to be or live tracks tend to be in their respective distributions for each of their vignettes. The p-value is basically zero. There's like 16 zeros before the first significant digit. The test is very is able to conclusively determine that at least one of these uh, live tracks isn't matching up to its MNS to its corresponding MNS tracks, right? And therefore, that's a reason to not completely trust the MNS system. So we've already, I would say, made an improvement over looking at a graph and saying whether we think it matches up or not. Now. This method is a good first start, and it will serve as the basis for another method I'm about to talk about. But let's talk about what's wrong with this method. And in order to understand what's wrong with it, we're going to take a step back from talking about functions and these curves and start talking about 2D data uh, this time. You've seen 2D data before on a, on a Cartesian plane. And let's imagine now that we're talking about a modeling and sim tool where we've got a bomber, it flies over a range and then drops a bomb. And what I'm plotting here is where that bomb landed. The black dots represent the, um, the, uh, the spot where the MS bombs fell, and the red dot represents where the live bomb fell. If we were to judge how unusual that live bombing was relative to the MS bombings by just looking at how far away it is from the center, what we would probably notice is, based off of distance alone, it's not that unusual because there's actually a fair number of MS bombings that are even further away from the center than the live bombing. And yet, at the same time, our eyes, which are still good things, they're able to pick out that something is awry, which what's, what, what is awry is that the live bombing didn't, doesn't actually follow the general pattern seen in the MS bombings. Right? It's, it's still an outlier, just not in terms of how far away it is from the center. So how could we account for the divergence in the shape, right? the fact that it's not following the same pattern? Well, we could do a procedure what, known as a principal component analysis. With principal component analysis, we're going to identify the directions of principal variation in our data, where even coming up with this new coordinate system where we say, most of the bombings uh, tend to fall along this 45-degree line, right? That's th where most of the variation is happening, along this 45-degree line. And then there's also a lesser direction where there's some additional variation that's orthogonal to that 45-degree line. Right? Even doing this in and of itself already reveals something about your data set. It tells you the direction in which um, a lot of your variation is happening. But what we're going to do is we're going to treat this new understanding of our data set as a new coordinate system. We're going to take, imagine taking this picture, rotating it so that those uh, axes that I'm showing there are now in the canonical directions, pointing to the right and pointing upwards. So rotate it and then scale it so that they're also on the same scale. And do that with all of the points in our data set. And after we do our new rotation and scaling, that gives, generates a new picture where now when we look at how far away the live bombing was in this new coordinate system, now, the, now how far away it is from the center actually means something, right? It actually is revealing to you just how unusual that live bombing was. So this, is, this was for all working with two-dimensional data, and similar sort of pr principles are going to hold for functional data, it's just more complicated, right? But we can, but the, uh, looking at distance alone, that's the reason why our distance metric before is not exactly perfect, it's not accounting for systematic correlations in our data set. And also, uh, this also suggests a solution on how we could address it. What we're going to do is a procedure known as functional principal component analysis, which is a procedure that serves the basis of many uh, statistical procedures for functional data. And we're just going to be, so therefore, you're learning a lot about functional data analysis just from understanding this one concept. Right? Where what we do with functional principal component analysis is that we understand that it is possible to represent um, a single function as the sum of other functions. It's an infinite sum, but this sum is convergent, which means that it is possible to get a good approximation for any of the functions in our data set by taking that infinite sum and then cutting it off at some k. 
So we're going to decide how many of these functions we're actually going to use, and what this effectively does is it turns our infinite dimensional complicated problem into a multivariate problem like what we've seen before, right, where we have a lot of methods in order to handle that. So with uh, functional principle component analysis, we are decomposing our functional data set into two component parts. We have this set of principal directions, which is going to be our functional principal components, right, which it would potentially be possible to look at these functional principal components and actually learn something about how our data varies, kind of like how in that two-dimensional picture, looking at one of, those one of those principal components showed most of our bombings lie along a 45-degree line. That's where most of the variation is happening. The way I constructed this fictitious data set, that is not going to be the case. You're not going to be able to look at anything, any of those uh, 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 principal component functions and really learn anything because I know that they don't really mean all that much. Right. But that said, even having these principal component functions still allows you to rank how each of your observations, like how these observations rank according to how much it uh, varies in those principal directions, right? To, uh, so we end up with uh, these, these, uh, these functions and also these scores with respect to each function. So to try and, con and by the way, if anyone here has ever uh, done any, any sort of Fourier analysis or Fourier analysis, this should rhyme. Right? It is based on the same mathematical principles. So um, to kind of convey this idea, uh, here's taking the first seven uh, prin functional principal components, taking the live flight and that vignette I showed, and I'm adding up some of these functions together in order to approximate that live flight um, or that live track. Uh, and with, I think, seven or eight of these functions, you're able to get a very good approximation for what that track is, which means that we can summarize that track with eight numbers with, uh, with not that much error, right? So in fact, I have, now do you need seven or eight flights in the real world? The one situation that I've heard of of someone using uh, functional data to understand real world um, data sets, which uh, this was at ATEC, and uh, ATEC was kind of leading the way on this, and uh, they were, and they actually weren't working in an MNS context, but they were able to do it with one principal component. So they were able to basically take all their data set and understand it with one number. So um, my understanding is that if you're working with real world data sets, you actually could learn a lot from just a couple principal components. Right? So um, anyway, going back to these data sets, uh, we, uh, here are basically the uh, basis functions, the functional principal components for each of those vignettes. As I said, there's not really much, see, much to see in this case. And then we are able to construct these clouds of points where we're now kind of able to think about this like a two-dimensional data set, even though you actually need more like seven or eight. But we're going to look at the top two, the, ones, the two where most of the variation is happening. And even looking at the first two principal components, you can kind of tell with your eyes now that there is something unusual about the live flights, right? That they have a tendency to hang out in the periphery of the MNS flights distribution, right? And in fact, when you do a Fisher combined probability test, as I described earlier, looking only now you're using this as your coordinate system and you're working with this multivariate data, you get basically the same conclusion um, as you did before. So yeah, doing things better in this case didn't change the p-value that I got in the end, but it's a more robust method. And that basically concludes my demonstration. And as I said, the, the title of this talk is this is a preview of functional data analysis, right? I don't even, even consider it an introduction. So what do I mean by that? Well, first off, my goal today is to convince you that there is something good here and that these types of methods should be used for understanding and analyzing data, at least regarding radar data, right? And I think I've made a good case for how for the utility there, um, which saying that in and of itself means that functional data methods could have application in relevant to a lot of acquisition programs because lots of things use radars, right? Missile programs, uh, radar programs themselves, whether they be sea or land-based or air-based, or even the si situations where the object under study itself isn't a radar or using a radar but is being looked at by a radar, like an F-35, um, those are all situations where you could potentially get some goodness from using these types of methods. And as I described earlier, I think there are other situations as well where we could uh, use these uh, statistical procedures. I'm thinking of using these potentially for sonar data, um, which 
is which is a similar type of situation. It's just now all underwater. Um, but in order to uh, understand some of the programs that are of concern to me, uh, here are some of the here, here are some books that you could potentially look at in order to uh, see in order to learn more about this. Uh, type of analysis. The classic book is going to be Ramsey and Silverman's Functional Data Analysis. I think their primary goal in this book is to give you some basic methods and also to show you how functional data is different from other types of data that you may be used to, be it univariate or multivariate data, because there are some things that do not translate, or they do not necessarily translate well or immediately. Right? And they're trying to um, – and I would say that their primary goal is getting you started working with functional data and how to represent it. Uh, the book in the middle, uh, the top author, Leo Horvat, that he was my advisor in grad school. And this book, I think, has a really good discussion about the mathematics and statistical inference for functional data. Right? So um, that – and I care a great deal about statistical inference, and therefore I am rather a fan of that book, even, the, even aside from it being written by my advisor. Um, and then the book on the right is very much like, how do you do this in software? Because R has uh, and some R packages uh, uh, devoted to functional data, like the FDA package. This is a well-known package. Jump also has some pretty good uh, functional data capabilities. And that they have given some talks at DataWorks as well about their functional data capabilities. And, uh, and uh, they do have some tools where I'm, I'm an R user. I'm going to always use R. But I do look at some of those tools, and it's like, yeah, that's pretty good. So. Um, but yeah, there are computational tools out there in order to work with this type of data. Okay, so uh, that is my presentation, and I am ready for your questions. Yes. Thank you very much for a great presentation. Um, I've used functional data before, and so I'm convinced already I was not a hard sell. Yeah. Um, and I can think of one project that I have on my plate right now where this is going to be really, really handy. So I'd be interested in talking with you afterwards about that. But my sure. question is, I can't do 20 replications. I can do maybe five. Um, have you done simulations when you have a fewer number of replicates? Yeah. <laughs> um, so now I won't say I've done simulations. I just said th that for that example, what happens if I go from 20 down to 5? Do I get the same answer? In that case, the answer was yes, with, an, with a, again, another minuscule p-value. And I will say that I've been thinking about this type of analysis largely in the context where um, your sample size is not going to be determined by statistics but by the availability of range and the availability of, and the amount of money you got. And that's largely why I was, why I've been somewhat attracted to this. It's like, okay, we're not going to get that many trials, but for any individual trial, we're going to have a lot of information. Now, in previous versions of this slide, some people have seen this and been concerned. Are you saying that we only need five trials? Now, in this situation, here's what I would caution. People went into this thinking, uh, so in this hypothetical scenario, people went in saying we're going to use MNS to, uh, we're going to leverage MNS to have a better understanding of some system, some platform. We're going to make a comparison of the MNS to uh, live, to some live data, and uh, hopefully we will find out that the MNS is matching up, and then we will be able to actually get some information, but we're not going to collect as much live data because we're going to be using a lot of MNS. <laughs> so based off of that, what just happened here? What happened here is that you used a powerful statistical method. You don't have a lot of live data, but the statistical method is powerful enough that you were able to conclude fairly well that the MNS is not describing what's happening in the real world. So your MNS is not trustworthy, and you don't have a lot of live data. So how now are you going to be able to make statements about the live data that you wanted to be able to make? Because your MNS can't do it, and you don't have enough live data, so you seem to be in a sticky situation. That being said, um, I, yeah, I have been thinking that context that you're talking about is a major motivator for why I'm doing this. I haven't done like formal simulation studies, but I did like take the example that I had and cut it down to five and looked at what happened. So um, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and to me, I would think that you would not want to scale them because you want the first principal components to hold more weight than the other ones. Mm -hmm. But I wondered 
if you have any comments about that. Uh, what I'm largely interested in this situation is how far uh, the observation. I have decided that those like that a certain number of principal components were uh, captured most of the variation. So I was largely interested in seeing how far things were moving in those principal directions. All right. So uh, I would say that. I'm sure that there's a way that you can do it without scaling it. Well, no, not really. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think in the end, like, where you're tr interested, like, how far is it relative to the others in that direction, you still end up uh, taking the scale out. Right when you're when you are doing that, so you're going to end up removing it one way or another, or accounting for it one way or another. Okay, yeah, I'm not sure if I agree, but we can maybe talk later. But okay. um, I was also wondering if you had any thoughts about using the Mahalanobis distance instead, um, instead of doing the principal components. I don't know that much about it, so I okay. haven't used it. No I'm worries. aware that it exists, but I'm, and I'm aware of the name, and that's all I know. Okay, no worries. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Hi, great presentation. Uh, obviously, with your example, yes, it's significantly different, but sometimes significance is different than practical mm -hmm. difference. And I wonder, you know, maybe I'm one of the ones who would fool myself looking at it just with the eye test at the beginning, but I just wonder your thoughts if you think, you know, can it still be good enough even though it's significantly different and sometimes we run into whoever developed the model there's no more funding to improve the model that's the best we've got at this current moment mm -hmm. you know is it better than nothing or if we don't have it you know what happens so I guess that's my yeah. uh, so my in point. terms of should I should my assessment ever just uh, end completely at the uh, conclusion of a statistical hypothesis test I would say never Right, you always should have a more holistic view of a data set than what a hypothesis test says. Right, so certainly we would we would still want to draw those pictures and look at them in order to try and understand, like, well, what actually does it look like relative to the data? Do I care about this type of distance, or do I care about this type of divergence? Um, and that's where things like constructing confidence intervals and prediction intervals, but again, intervals that are appropriate for this kind of data. Right, where I actually do have a number of slides that are talking about why you want it, why we, you would want to use simultaneous confidence intervals appropriate to functional data, and what that even means. Uh, so, um, but yeah, you still would, you know, looking at those types of intervals, making trying to construct one for MNS and one for live, looking at how live uh, flight compares, you still would want to do that. And there may be some other methods as well in order to try and get at okay, it's different, but how is it different, and is that acceptable? Because it is also true when talking about modeling and simulation that it isn't going to be a perfect representation of reality, but is it close enough, right? And it is the, is the difference between reality and what the model says, is it something that we can live with? Um, so yeah, certainly, um, and there's probably going to be methods out there that facilitate that kind of understanding as well, like for example, looking at confidence intervals. Um, I think that I think that's my answer. <laughs> so, any other questions? Okay, I think that's it. Let's thank our speaker.